Will Willeman, former bishop of the United Methodist Church and one of my favorite preachers, tells the story of the very worst funeral service he ever attended. So the story he told is from many, many years ago, so I may get some of the details wrong. I believe it was a distant cousin of his wife who had passed away. Is, as is often the case in those sorts of circumstances, when you do not know someone, you wonder, their distant relatives, should you go? But if you're the closest family member, there's kind of an obligation that you go to represent your particular group of family members. And so this is what happened. Bishop Wilman and his wife drove from North Carolina out into the backwoods of a little church in South Carolina to go to a funeral of a distant cousin named James. Everyone called him Jimmy. Family and friends, evidently. The pastor welcomed people there. He knew who Bishop Will Willman was, who's written so many great books on preaching. Uh, in fact, he, he even made it a point to say, we are not a denominational church. He was said in a very confrontational manner, we are very proud of the fact that we're a Bible church here. Bishop Willman knew he was in for an experience already. When it came time for the sermon, the preacher stood up and, and just began the sermon like this. It's too late for Jimmy. It's too late for Jimmy. And the sermon got worse from there. He looked out at the congregation. He said, you need to get right with Jesus. Today's the day to get right with Jesus. Jimmy can't get right with Jesus. It's it's too late for Jimmy now, isn't it? And then he said, are you making bad decisions? Do you need to change your ways? You better change your ways now. Jimmy can't. Jimmy's dead. J Jimmy's dead. It's too late for Jimmy. And he just went on and on. When the service finally concluded, they went to the cemetery, which was very close by, much, much to his, uh, his, his everlasting thank thanksgiving, uh, there was no luncheon at the funeral or at the, at, the, at the church afterwards. Bishop Willman said it was great because during the service, it was all he could do not to run up on stage, push the preacher out of the way and grab the microphone. So, so not to have to look at that preacher to sit into that backwards church one second longer was, was wonderful. Instead, as soon as the burial site was over, he jumped in the car, hopefully just barely waited long enough for his wife to get in the passenger seat, and then he just gunned. It. He just took off on these country roads to drive away from this backwards church as fast as he could. And for the next 10, 12 minutes, he just was ranting. That's the worst sermon I've ever heard. Not a word about Jesus, no gospel, no hope, no peace. He just, he just, in his words, eviscerated that pastor in that church over the next 10 or 12 minutes. The whole time, whole time, his wife hasn't said a single word. She's been nodding on occasion. So finally, after 10 or 12 minutes, and he's traveled a significant period, uh, 20, 30 miles in his words, he turns to his wife and he said, well, do you have anything to add? And she said, well, I too thought the sermon was horrible. He left out so many things, like you mentioned, Jesus, hope, peace. But she said, I'm really surprised you didn't mention the most offensive part. And he went through immediately. He's driving along thinking, what the most offensive part? I've, I've railed about the sermon, the preacher, the, the, the fact that he didn't mention Jesus. Or well, how could you say that with a grieving widow right there with children? How? And he had gone down everything. So he finally said, well, what, what did you find the most offensive? And she said, well, the fact that he left out all those things we need to hear was bad enough, but the worst part was every word he said was absolutely true. It's too late for Jimmy. Bishop Woolman said he drove the rest of the way in silence. Didn't talk to his wife until they got back home in North Carolina. <laughs> now, I am not suddenly... Uh, standing before you saying, I think I'm going to rethink the way I do or the way we approach funeral sermons. We, we are not going to do that. But before, before we get too overly offended by some backwoods South Carolina preacher, it should be noted, if that we're really honest, we're probably more than a little frustrated with how Jesus packages the Word of God on occasion. Like the 13th chapter of Luke's Gospel. 
Jesus says a few things that probably make us uncomfortable if we're willing to listen to him. First of all, there is a huge crowd. Luke tells us there are thousands of people. You have the disciples, but you have thousands of people. By the time we get to the 13th chapter of Luke, who are coming to hear Jesus. They come with questions. We all come with questions to Jesus. I'm guessing that's part of the reason why we come to church. We have questions in our lives. The most common question for religious leaders throughout time, I think, has been, if you boil it down, it comes down to one basic question. Why do bad things happen to good people? You could, you could package that question in a variety of ways. Why is there suffering? Why is there pain? Why is there evil in the world? But it ultimately comes back to that boiled down question, why do bad things happen to good people? This is certainly the question the Hebrew people have in the 13th chapter of Luke's Gospel. It's not a hypothetical. It's real for them. There are a group of people in Galilee, Galileans, just like them, probably neighbors, maybe family members, who had just died. Pontius Pilate, who was appointed by Rome to look after Israel, especially Jerusalem, to keep the peace. What Pontius Pilate would do in order to keep peace is he would find so-called troublemakers to make an example of them. He would either throw them in prison, he would torture them, or he would have his soldiers kill them. This is what happened to a group of Galileans. The people who are talking to Jesus are probably talking about family members or neighbors or, or at least people that they identify as people like them. And they want to know why. Why did these people die? Did, did they do something? Had, had they done something wrong that somehow God allowed this to happen because they, maybe, maybe they deserve this? That's the question that they have before them. That's the question they have been wrestling with it. Because if they did something wrong, then the world becomes a slightly safer place, right? If bad things happen to good people who make bad choices, then as long as you avoid those bad choices, the world is a safer, more predictable, easier to navigate world to live in. We come to Jesus with similar questions, don't we? I don't know about you, but, but I do. I wonder why people who I care about, who are very, very similar to one another, how, why one walks in to a hospital and walks out with a diagnosis of cancer and the other person walks in with the same exact symptoms and walks out with something that's going to be taken care of in 24 hours. I wish I had an answer. I want to know why a little girl in third grade grows up surrounded by parents and a host of adults who love and care about her while another girl exactly the same age living in the same community doesn't seem to have any adults who have invested in her life. I'd, I'd like to know why that is. I have a host of questions. I would like to know, and I'm guessing you do as well, because if we knew the answers, it would make the world a safer place easier to navigate, to figure out if you do this, it leads to that, and if you do this, it leads to this. At least we would know how the world works. We, like the Hebrew people then and now, we come to Jesus with our questions, which is why the 13th chapter of Luke's gospel is so frustrating. Because did you hear Jesus give an answer? If you, if you did, you're reading the wrong passage. In fact, Jesus stands up and he says, you, you think those people in Galilee did something wrong? Do you think they're worse sinners, that they made bigger mistakes than anyone else? No, they're not. They're just like everybody else. Pain, suffering, evil, tragedy, it's, it's a part of life. And, and rather than to bring people's anxiety down, Jesus raises their anxiety. He starts talking about other tragedy. He said, hey, remember that Tower of Siloam? It fell down. It was just a building, building outside of Jerusalem that, that fell down. He said it, it killed 18 people. Do you think just because the 18 people happened to be in that building or walking by, they were somehow worse sinners? That they had made greater mistakes? No. Tragedy, pain, suffering, it happens. That's how the world exists. You see what Jesus is doing? He's, he, he, 
they're looking for answers and Jesus to, to give them peace. And Jesus is actually just raising their level of anxiety. And so the people gather around listening to Jesus say, so, so what, what can we do? If the world's not predictable, if the world isn't safe, if you can't give us any advice to help navigate the world, what, what can you do for us? And Jesus says, I got a story for you. They come looking for answers. Jesus offers a story. He says there was a man who owned a vineyard. And he goes out and there's this tree, this fig tree that doesn't produce any fruit. And so he turns to his gardener and he says, you get rid of it. I've been coming to this place looking at this tree for years. I come out here and it never produces fruit. It's just wasting the soil. So you cut it down. I don't care if you get an ax. I don't care if you use a chainsaw. Fire up the old John Deere, put a chain around it and pull it out. But you, you get rid of this today. You cut it down. And the gardener says, maybe, could, could I have one more year? How about I'll dig around it in order to, I can irrigate it and I can put a fertilizer on it. I, give it a year to bear fruit. And if it doesn't produce fruit in a year, then you can cut it down. That's Christ's response to the questions being asked. Why is there suffering in the world? We come to Jesus looking for answers. Jesus tells us a story about dying shrubbery. Not exactly what we were looking for, is it? But before we discount this, do you know what just happened? We come, like the Hebrew people, looking for answers. Jesus says there are no answers, at least answers you're going to understand or comprehend in the mystery of God to these questions. And so we, like the Hebrew people, stand saying, so what do we do? If the world's not predictable, if there's not, uh, you know, there used to be a thought, if, if I just work hard and say my prayers and eat my vitamins and everything is going to be just fine, Jesus says, no, no, it, it might not be. Well, if there are no certainties in life, then what, what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to live? And then Jesus tells a story. Instead of giving you answers, do you know what he just gave you? He gave you a job. We come looking for answers and Jesus gives us a job because you, people of God, you're the tree. You are the tree and the expectation is that you and I will bear fruit. I imagine the follow-up questions are, but Jesus, if I just understood why this happened, Jesus said, no, love your neighbor. But if, I could just, if you could just explain why, no, love your neighbor. It continues to go back to this again and again and again. The tree in the story gets, remember, one year. One year to bear fruit. And after one year, if it does not bear fruit, it gets cut down. Now you know me. Unless you're a guest here at the church, you know me that I am not a fire and brimstone sort of preacher, right? Some of you are even smiling because I am very, very far from a fire and brimstone preacher. The challenge, however, the mistake I make is that sometimes in both my theology, frankly, and sometimes in the way I approach preaching, is that sometimes I may eliminate or alleviate the urgency of Christ's message. And here's what I mean. There is an urgency to us bearing fruit. I don't know if you know this or not. You're going to die someday. If I'm the first person who has ever told you that, I am sorry I didn't say it in a more delicate manner, uh, but, but you are going to die someday. I remember the day I figured that out for myself. I was 20 years old. I know you usually figure those things out in life a little bit sooner, but I was 20 years old. I was talking to my Old Testament professor, uh, a former Lutheran pastor, no less. I sat down with him because I had all sorts of questions and I needed some wise advice. So I asked Chip Buzard from Wartburg College, Chip, I, 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 need, I need some help. I, I need to know, what, what am I supposed to be in life? What am I supposed to do? I had all these big, big questions, and you know what he told me? He said, Justin, there are two things you can be certain of in life. Former Lutheran pastor, number one is what? You're a child of God, right? Right? No. Number one, Justin, you're going to die someday. Okay. 
Number two, I want to interrupt you. I know what it is. I'm going to close my eyes in this life. I'm going to hear the voice of Jesus, and my eyes are going to be open, and I'm going to stand before God, right? That's what I was thinking. No, no. Number one, Justin, you're going to die. Number two, Justin, your family and friends are going to gather together to say goodbye to you. They're going to go to a cemetery someplace. They're going to put you in the ground, he added. They're going to kick dirt on your casket. Then they're going to go back to a church, probably in a church basement somewhere that's not very well lit. They're going to eat turkey sandwiches and talk about the weather. (laughs) What kind of pastor were you? (laughs) How awful was this? I just stood there. I was 20 years old. I about started crying. This was so depressing to me. And then, then do you know what he said? Your life You get one life, and it's going to go by very, very quickly. So you might as well do something extraordinary with it. People of God, there's an urgency to bear fruit. How different would your life look if you had one year? Not 10 years, not 5 years, not 13 months. What if you had just one year to love your spouse? What if you had just one year to cherish your children? What if you had one year to make an impact on the lives of people in your neighborhood, in your community? How different would your life look? There's an urgency to what Jesus is saying. Now, I want to be very clear. The urgency to bear fruit is not for your sake. You don't somehow have to get right by right with God by doing good things. In in fact, I'm pretty clear, pretty sure that Jesus has already made you right with the Father through his life, death, and resurrection. It isn't for your sake. Bearing fruit is for the sake of your neighbor. And thanks be to God, we have a gardener named Jesus Christ who comes to you and to me this day and says, there is still time. I have done all the work. I have done the pruning, I have done the fertilizing, I have done the digging, and I am going to continue to be at work in your life. There is still time for you to bear fruit, but people of God, Jesus says to you this day, that time is now. The time for you to love your neighbor and make an impact on those around you, it is is today. There is still time, but it is today. It is now is that time. May we bear fruit. May we love our neighbor. Amen.